Hi, my name is Rich Boyajan, and I'm a nurse practitioner at the Dana-Farber Brigham and Women's Cancer Center in Boston, and also a cancer survivor. Welcome to our second show uh, of Safe Journey, the Cancer Survivor's Journey of Discovery. This show is going to be about prostate cancer, so primarily this will be focused on um, obviously uh, the health of men after they're done with prostate cancer treatment. And prostate cancer is the second most common cancer diagnosis in men b besides skin cancer. And to put it in perspective, uh, there's about a little over 230,000 men in the United States this year are going to be diagnosed with prostate cancer. And these folks typically have a range of treatments, but unfortunately, some, sometimes it doesn't always work, and about 30,000 men will die this year from prostate cancer. To put that in perspective, tonight the Bruins are playing the Canadians at the, uh, the TD Garden, and there's about 18,000 people that are going to watch that game in the stadium. So you would have to fill that stadium up and empty it again and then fill it up um, uh, another half and that's how many people are going to pass away from prostate cancer this year. The good news though is that in 2014 there's almost 3 million, there's about 2,700,000 men living uh, with prostate cancer, excuse me, surviving prostate cancer. And again that's because of the treatment that they've received. And I'm not going to talk about specifically about the ins and outs of the different types of treatment. What I wanted to do is just elaborate a little bit in regards to what usual treatment options are. And then what we're going to do is transition to uh, an interview with Lori Appleby. She's a prostate cancer expert, a nurse practitioner at the Dana-Farber Brigham and Women's Cancer Center that focuses on prostate cancer and prostate cancer survivorship. So when a man, a man is diagnosed with prostate cancer, uh, it's obviously a very frightening time. And what can make it even more difficult is that there's more than one good treatment option. So there's radiation therapy, radiation therapy plus hormone therapy, and surgery. So when a man's diagnosed, and again, depending on what um, stage of cancer they have, surgery can be an option where you would meet with a urologist who could remove the prostate. And that, again, is uh, a good alternative for treatment, but it does come with some side effects and concerns that, again, Lori will talk about a little bit more later. But the primary ones with uh, radical prostatectomy, which is the surgery to remove the prostate, is incontinence can be an issue after uh, surgery where there can be both complete incontinence where a man may have to wear a diaper or it can be what's called stress incontinence where if they cough, sneeze, laugh they may have um, some leakage of urine. So that can happen after surgery as well as sexual dysfunction or erectile dysfunction after surgery as well. With radiation therapy there can be uh, uh, erectile dysfunction is also something that can happen as well as one of the other things can be urinary uh, changes so people might have more difficult time urinating or they may have more urinary frequency but these are things that again Lori will talk about that can happen after treatment. Some of the other things with um, radiation that can happen is there can be some small amount of blood after or rectal bleeding or bowel issues as well and with surgery there can also be pain related to the surgery that they've had. And the other big component to treatment can be some men require hormone treatment but it's actually not giving a man hormones it's actually giving someone medication to shut off their testosterone production because testosterone fuels prostate cancer. And when you shut off someone's testosterone, it can increase their risks of cardiovascular disease, as well as uh, weight gain, fatigue, hot flashes, again, things that Lori will talk about. All of these treatments can cure a man of their prostate cancer, but 
and what cancer, what we're talking about for cancer survivors is how to deal with the repercussions of their, uh, of their treatment and how to improve their quality of life because that's the number one thing. And Lori's going to talk a little bit more about that, about what the different options are. But the number one thing is to talk to your doctor, talk to your nurse practitioner if you're having any of these issues after your treatment. So uh, my name's Rich Boyajan. I wanted to welcome people back to a safe journey uh, about cancer survivorship. And, uh, and this is our resident expert on prostate cancer, Lori Appleby, who's a nurse practitioner at the Dana-Farber Brigham and Women's Cancer Center. And I wanted to ask her questions about what's important when treatment is done and dealing with the effects afterwards. So, welcome, Lori. Thank you, Rich. It's nice to be here. Thank you. And no, and I mean, I know you've taken care of many men with prostate cancer, and um, really wanted to get your ideas on what advice would you give to them, and, and ask you on specific issues that might come up. And um, I don't know in general. I, I guess we could start off with one of the biggest things I think that is that that worry the fear of it and how do you, what do you talk to patients about you know when they're done and they're following that PSA and 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 it's the you know it, it's kind of micromanaging it if you will right the PSA has been a blessing and a curse for us uh, a blessing in that it does give us for the most part a very good indicator of what's happening uh, in terms of prostate cancer or not mm -hmm. and uh, but on the other hand um, patients seem to hang their hat on the PSA and it's not all the PSA and even when it is all the PSA it's not doesn't necessarily harbor bad things to come so it's um, what we try to do before um, a man is treated is set reasonable expectations because we know from our experience and reviewing the literature and studies that are out there uh, that we can predict not of course with 100 percent certainty but we can give people a general idea of what they can expect their course to be um, pre during and post treatment so people should um, hopefully that when they talk to their providers have an understanding of what to expect beforehand so right. that when they're before, done with it. Beforehand and you know what can they expect afterwards what uh, you know men worry rightfully so can this come back mm -hmm. and we can we can give them an idea of what the chances of that are and so it's I think it's important if, if patients want to know that information to ask anything they want to know they should ask. No and that's that's good advice and I guess um, the, you know, and then the other things that we deal with is, um, you know, usually initially they have a good response to treatment, and you know they, and you know people might use the word cure, but there can be side effects of the treatments, you know, depending on, you know, and one of the big ones that um, I think that uh, maybe doesn't get discussed as much because uh, people are a little embarrassed, and is the sexual dysfunction. Right. You know, right. Th those are things, you know. I mean, I guess, how do you? Um, how do you broach that with people and you know what do you talk to them about well we we you're right patients can be reluctant to ask about it especially if their partner accompanies them to the visits um, so we in discuss discussing the side effects of a certain treatment plan will include um, erectile dysfunction as one of the side effects and we try to get an idea from the patient right from the outset what their erectile function is prior to um, because that can be a helpful predictor of what it will be afterwards um, but you know there are risks for erectile dysfunction with radiation therapy and with um, radical prostatectomy sure. even the nerve sparing approach uh, about 60 percent of men um, you know within the six months of their surgery will have some um, erectile dysfunction that gets better. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so at two years, I think it's 40%. Right. Um, and yeah. radiation therapy, the numbers are a little lower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a little bit different in that I think that the radiation, it's more of a delayed, it's not as immediate. That's right. But it, at about two years, it's. At, at two years, so it's almost the opposite. The radiation 
it's better initially and two years, you know, within two years it can worsen. And I guess, um, you know, everyone watches football games and you see all the Viagra ads and the Cialis ads and obviously those are things that are used pretty regularly and I think, um, I know some men have gotten disappointed because their um, erectile dysfunction doesn't respond as well. And I, right. what do you talk about as other kind of alternatives to them? So there are um, other modalities, um, vacuum pumps, mm -hmm. um, there are penile injections um, that can um, restore, it's on an as needed basis sure. you can take this. Um, there are penile implants. And um, there are other modalities uh, as well, but I think the key is to get the advice of an expert. And uh, if it, and we refer people to um, one of the urologists at the Brigham, and, uh, who has a specialty in erectile dysfunction, because mm -hmm. I think they the experts know all the options and what option would work best for a particular individual. So. I guess the important thing would be to make sure that the patients or their spouse or um, partner are comfortable talking to you about it and then giving them some basic education but referring them to kind of the experts in that. Like you yes. said, there's the sexual dysfunction clinic at the Brigham, also the sexual health clinic here uh, at the Dana-Farber, which also offers, I think, um, emotional counseling right. to, yes, to deal with the loss of your erectile right. function. We have a psychologist who uh, works very well with couples around that issue in particular. And you know, and then I think from what I've, from what I've seen, it, it seems to be how important is your sexual health in, in regards to your relationship and in and, and far as prioritizing, you know, how far you go. Right. So, um, Sorry. No, no. no. Uh, a lot of men are, are do not have good function prior to their treatment, mm -hmm. um, and are have made their adjustments, and their partners have made their adjustments, um, and so for those folks, it's relatively easy. There isn't a lot of intervention, um, but getting that information beforehand so you know what to plan for the patient is important. Um, the other issues, I mean, with um, you know, with having prostate cancer and having surgery or radiation, could be urinary issues, I guess, yes. and that can be just as problematic for people and embarrassing and um, right. reduce their quality of life. And how do you, right. you know, what, how do you talk to people about that? So this is an, this is an issue, particularly with the patients that have had surgery. Um, there can be damage to the urinary sphincter, which is what gives us control, uh -huh. and um, uh, and so there can be prolonged incontinence. Most men will have incontinence within the first uh, month post um, surgery, surgery. Okay. and we tell them that up front. Um, but, and we also recommend that they do so, what we call Kegel exercises, which strengthens the pelvic floor, and okay. if done correctly and um, regularly, can um, sort of hasten the um, return of uh, urinary function. Oh, so you, so Kegel exercises um, kind of as in, in, I guess, prophylactically to kind of... Not prophylactically. It okay. doesn't, doesn't really work to do it beforehand. Okay, so and afterwards... There has been some data to, to, that shows that to be the case. So we don't necessarily recommend it before their surgery. Okay. But after their surgery, we definitely recommend it. Okay. And most men will... There's a, only a, I think it's 1% of men require um, sphincter replacement after surgery. And, well, and you know, I think that um, while you're, it, it's a minority of people, could you tell them a little bit about the artificial urethral, I mean, I think that that's been something for some patients that's been a, I'll say a, a lifesaver or a godsend because of the, right. their quality of life. Right, um, I mean, these men have to, you know, prior to the the placement of the sphincter, have to wear depends, and it's not generally men don't have complete incontinence mm -hmm. all the time. It's mainly coughing, sneezing. If their bladder is full, they may tend to leak. But the um, artificial sphincter can be extremely helpful in that it does restore um, continence, and it's relatively easy for the men to work. There's a, I don't know exactly how it's done in surgery, but the, a, 
um, a little valve is placed in the testicle. Okay. And men can activate it by just squeezing the valve. The valve, the sphincter will open. They let go, and the sphincter will close. And most people um, uh, do quite well with that. I would recommend that any um, it it be done by a urologist that does this quite, quite commonly. Sure. Um, so you just need a skilled technician, and outcomes are generally very good. And and then there you know there are issues with radiation and other things where you can have. Um, wear weaker streams or things like that right. and typically um, what, what typically can be done for things like that? So, so during radiation about half of men will have trouble with the urination either slow or weak stream, uh, urinary frequency, uh, getting up at night to go to the bathroom and so we uh, recommend the use of Flomax which relaxes the surrounding structures and lets the urine flow more freely. Um, and most men take this during the radiation and for maybe a few months afterwards, but then after that generally returns to normal. Right. Okay. No, that's uh, good to know. And one of the other things that, you know, um, with radiation a lot of times come um, hormone deprivation, so um, shutting off the testosterone. And right. Could you talk a little bit about why, why um, we do that? So uh, we used to in the old days uh, just give uh, radiation alone. Um, however, several studies showed uh, that if you combined radiation with hormonal therapy, the outcomes were better. Mm -hmm. They've also looked at radiation therapy comparing that to just hormones alone. Um, and there was a marked difference. The radiation group did much better than the hormones alone group. But the best modality is a combination of the two. And you know, no good deed goes unpunished, that unfortunately uh, shutting off someone's testosterone comes with side effects like a low libido. What other, you know, and what other things do we see in men that are on hormones? Um, weight gain mm -hmm. is one, and um, weight gain is more of an issue in younger men and men that are thin, which you wouldn't think, mm -hmm. think it'd be the opposite. But, and um, what do you typically are, advise for people that, you know, that are going to be on hormones? What, what type of, um, I guess, changes or things that you, you typically ask? Well, we, we kind of have a, a, a threefer. Uh, in other words, um, hormone therapy, as I mentioned, can cause weight gain, mm -hmm. it can cause loss of muscle mass, and it can cause loss of bone mass. So the one thing that can get at all those those three issues is exercise. That dirty little world. Yeah, that dirty little world. So exercise, weight-bearing exercise is huge. Okay. Um, and I, we cannot stress it enough you know, when we talk with, talk to patients. And you don't have to be train, train for a marathon or, or do really strenuous things, but walking every day um, or five days a week for 20 to 30 minutes will, will help. Great. Yeah, that's good to hear. You know, so and that'll address kind of the weight, the bone health, as well as the muscle mass. Right. That's great. And I know that there have been some large studies that have looked at people who prostate cancer survivors who have exercised regularly that there may actually be better outcomes. And, right. You know, right. Uh, and as far as um, with bone health, are there other things that they should be aware of, or um, you know, should they be talking to their doctor about? Any vitamins or vitamin levels? The calcium and vitamin D are we usually recommend to, to take during the hormonal therapy. Okay. Um, a lot of us are vitamin D deficient for various reasons. Sunscreen, the sun doesn't shine much in the winter. Um, and so uh, we do check vitamin D levels before prescribing vitamin D. Okay. But that's something in general that you they should be talking to their pro uh, provider about if, they, right. if they're on hormones or if they've had hormones in the right. past. Or if they're on other medications such as steroids, mm -hmm. will also thin the bones and make it, uh, you know, sort of uh, be more imperative to do the exercise and calcium and vitamin D replacement. And um, along, and you had mentioned that there's weight gain, uh, you know, there's bone health issues as well. Um, you know, as well as loss of muscle mass and maybe increase of um, fat or adipose right. tissue. I, the other concern, I guess, that people, I would have with that would be um, 
is there any increased cardiovascular risk with something like that? Um, the answer is yes and no. Uh, for the most part, the answer is no. However, if you have a uh, history of congestive heart failure uh -huh. or have had a recent heart attack or myocardial infarction, uh, there is some increased risk, uh, cardiac risk, especially with the congestive heart failure. So we're very, we, it's, it's, you know, an individual case-by-case -case sure. basis. Um, but if they, if they have a history of cardiac issues, you, I guess, would you advise making sure they have good follow-up for their, Absolutely. you know, as well as, um, does, uh, um, does the hormone deprivation therapy that, does that affect um, cholesterol levels at all or things like that? It can. It can affect cholesterol levels. So it's important yes. to... And have good cardiac follow-up if they have a history of it. Right. And, and along with the cholesterol levels, there's been some um, evidence that it can uh, increase uh, the incidence of glucose intolerance or diabetes. So, okay. So then, so it is very, you know, that, um, again, if they're on hormones, then all of those things are very important. And I guess the takeaway message is probably make sure that they are talking to their doctors about any concerns they have. Right. I, I do want to just Please. say one one caveat here is we're listing all the side effects of hormone replacement therapy. However, the majority of men uh, do quite well with, with hormone replacement. Yes, they may gain a little bit of weight. Um, they may be a little more tired, but the vast majority of men do do not have glucose intolerance. Do not have you know high cholesterol levels as a result. So the kind of the risks um, of actually are, are on the lower side, but the benefits of using the hormone deprivation far away. Correct. And no, and I think that that should be a takeaway to most survivors uh, after treatment um, are doing very well, and you know a lot of these side effects that can happen can be managed pretty well, but it it really requires kind of communication and making sure that they don't have to suffer in silence, if you right. will. I don't really like that yeah. term, but. A lot of times, if they don't tell you, then you know it's impossible for you to kind right. of fix that. And, and, and the side effects are reversible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you stop the hormones, and yeah. your bone density gets better, your muscle mass comes back, your libido returns. Um, so. And so I guess the, the the final thing I'd ask about is the the emotional impact of all of this. And what do you advise about you know there are, you know there can be people that do struggle with whether it's from hormones or not but being diagnosed with cancer that affects your sexual function and mm -hmm. other and incontinence mm -hmm. there's there may be some depression anxiety and, and that fear and worry and, and what what do you talk to people about what, in regards to advising them about it? yeah I mean I think it, the, the loss of vigor uh, can be um, devastating for some men and we try to assess a patient's um, resilience, but I, that's not a really a good word uh, when we do our initial evaluation. Okay. And um, we rely too on a patient's partner to give us feedback as to how patients cope and um, what their coping me mechanisms are. Mm -hmm. Some, I, I would say most men do exceedingly well. They have hobbies. They have a, they have interests that they can immerse themselves in. Uh, that helps helps them deal with the whole process and the diagnosis. We do have a psychiatrist on our team that we can refer people to who may need medication for depression mm -hmm. as a result of their diagnosis. And we have a social worker who um, can do counseling and. Um, we always offer those services to, to we offer them to everyone, uh -huh. not everyone um, avails himself of it. But um, So again, I mean, it sounds like a broken record, but it's really making sure that the survivors talk to, you know, the, the, their providers, their nurse practitioner, their doctor, their nurse, about any anything negative that's going on so that hopefully we can help them fix it. Right, right. Well, no, I mean... Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, and Thanks for having me. You know, it, it, it's really just meant to begin a discussion so that people are a little bit more aware of 
um, some of the things that can go on afterwards and that they, they aren't alone out there and that there, there are people out there that you know, they can talk to if they need to. Right, and there are a lot of, um, well not a lot, but there's a, uh, uh, the Beth Israel has a cancer right. prostate cancer support group. Uh, it's held at the Beth Israel, but we from Dana Farber are, are involved in um, many of our our um, uh, clinicians will give talks and um, to the group, and I think they meet once a month. And uh, it's the men that attend find it invaluable. It's a great source of information. I have a, I've heard lots of people talk about it, and and what I'll do is um, I'll make sure that we include a link to kind of because you're right that's been going on for years and it years, has. and it's one of the most um, best kept secrets around for yeah. men with prostate cancer. So, well, thank you, Lori. Thanks, Rich. Okay. So welcome back. I, I hope you enjoyed uh, Lori Appleby's expertise and advice in regards to how to care for yourself as a prostate cancer survivor. Um, if there are any questions in regards to this show, I, I would welcome that you either, you can email us at the email address below. We also have a Facebook page that you can contact us through. I'd also like any suggestions if there is other topics that people that might have seen, might are watching the show right now would like. Um, I'm more than happy to talk about anything related to cancer survivorship. And if there are men out there that are wondering about prostate cancer or PSA screenings or things like that, please contact me. I'm more than happy to help um, provide answers to um, some of your questions uh, as well as point you in the right direction. So again, please reach out if there are any concerns. And again, thank you for your time. And uh, Lori, I'd like to thank you for the time you spent uh, informing us in regards to what the options are for prostate cancer survivors. Thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you soon.